G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Elise Bailu from Mind Life Project based in Melbourne. Thanks for your time today, Elise. My pleasure. Well, let's start with how we know each other. So Peter, our podcast producer, reached out and asked you to come on the cast. So thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Looking forward to the conversation. Can you tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money? Sure. So I started off really, it wasn't a business to begin with. It was really a passion and it led to a social enterprise called Mindful in May. So it's mindfulinmay.org. And basically we teach people how to use their minds to their best through mindfulness meditation. And it's a, predominantly it's a one month annual global campaign that people participate in and they get all the resources they need to make meditation a habit, learn from some of the world leaders in the space. And they also can make a donation to the cause. So we're about doing something good for yourself and doing something good for the world. Um, And the way we make money is basically we charge a small registration fee to all the participants and, um, and also following the annual campaign, I've developed further programs alongside the needs of the customer base in ongoing meditation support. Great. And what year did you start out? So I started out in about 2012. It was, I would say I didn't really start that as a business. It was more an experiment and an idea. I was working as a training in psychiatry at the time. So I was living kind of the double life and playing in this little space of meditation. And then it got a lot of momentum. So then really 2013 was when I began. Great. And what age were you then when you made the jump? start this up oh gee now you're testing my math <laughs> <laughs> i was uh probably about 32 yep great now mindfulness and meditation obviously a very important space particularly also with um, business owners i think because they can be quite frenetic and a lot get burnt out and if you don't invest a bit of that time in yourself um you you are missing a lot of value i think so i think it's a really, really good cause Thank you. Yeah, look, it's it's been invaluable to myself um, in all areas of life, whether that's parenting, business, and then just seeing the impact that it has is really my why. Yeah. And do you have any key numbers that illustrate the growth over the eight years? So, yeah, I basically I started off by myself. I had no idea about anything related to technology in the online space because I was working as a doctor mm-hmm. and I essentially bootstrapped it. So I didn't get any funding from outside. I looked at becoming a not-for-profit, but I decided that I wanted to become a for-purpose business because that would lead to less kind of admin and, you know, bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. So now I have um, about six people equivalent full-time. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we've teaching like many thousands of people each year how to meditate. And when was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? Well, there was a pivotal moment where I was living a double life. As I said, I was working in psychiatry at a hospital full time and I was about to start preparing for the next campaign and I started to get really uneasy. I literally actually became quite breathless and I was tuning in. I thought, what the hell's going on here? And I realized I was actually quite anxious. And that was because I had not clicked into the fact that what I was trying to do was actually completely unreasonable and unrealistic in a sense of running a business and working full time, it just wasn't possible. And so at that moment, I realized that I needed to make a decision to leap from career in medicine to entrepreneurship and taking these risks. And that was the year that the the business really grew the most uh, because I, you know, I I leapt out of my career. I, I wasn't actually taking a salary at that point. So it was quite a risky it felt risky at the time I didn't know what the outcome was going to be but I guess having that extra engine power by putting my whole self into it really paid off so that was really when I felt that wow I've just created a new career path for myself (laughs) and what does success look like to you it's a great question I think it's an evolving question evolving answer anyway I've had two kids in the process of running this business starting it and running it Mm -hmm. and so that's really changed things and it's changed, yeah, what what success does look like to me because before kids it was kind of all about, you know, I could put my whole self into my business and now it's much more holistic. It's about how do I, you know, be a good parent and have enough headspace for that alongside doing what I love in the world alongside 
creating, you know, having something that's financially viable that can support my family. So I think a combination of all of those things is success to me. I think really success is being clear on what, on what matters most to you mm. and then making sure that you're constantly checking in with that and actually living that out. Yeah, good advice. And also with the whole being present, uh, I think business owners can have a tendency, especially early on in their business career, to be really fixated and focused on business all the time or a lot of the time. And a bet does bear out if you have little ones that if you're not always present, you know, they can pick pick that up and uh, and, and pretty, Absolutely. pretty quickly and I, help you uh, fix that. Absolutely. And look, I also think that like everything in life, things have their seasons, you know, and what I've noticed for me is that as you know, whilst I was literally giving birth to my to my daughters at different times, then my my focus was different. And what I was hoping from the business was different in terms of the different kind of expectations you have around growth. So yeah, I think success and what success looks like really, really does change depending on the stage of life that you're in. And number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? Well, I think to be honest, doing something you really believe in, like what I do is my passion and I a hundred thousand percent believe in it and know that it works. So with marketing, that makes it quite easy because the story that I tell and what I share feels really authentic. So I think something around believing in what you're doing and feeling like you're really making a difference can make a hell of a lot of a difference in marketing. But if you're asking me around sort of more technical things, Mm. um, I would say that, what I've noticed is online, it's really difficult because as we know, the Facebooks of the world are constantly changing. And if you're relying on one particular channel, you're really going to be in trouble as, as has happened quite recently. And so you really have to think of that multiple pronged approach. And I I found actually really paying attention to my email list and growing that and nurturing that and making sure that I'm delivering, you know, high, high, high quality content has been really a wonderful outcome for us. Yeah, email is still very relevant these days. It's still the best return for any online marketing. Uh, the Direct Marketing Association in the US say estimates for every dollar you put into email marketing, you get forty-four dollars back. SEO, it's twenty-two. Social media marketing is twenty, and and so on. So yeah, building that list and using it wisely on a, on a good cadence, you know, does provide great returns. Yeah. And I've, I've noticed again on that note, that seasonality, you know, there's been periods where I just didn't have the capacity to create all the content and really nurture that email list because I was off having babies, et cetera. And I just hadn't done the whole batching and all of those kind of things that you're supposed to do. And when I did start attending more to it, I just really did notice. Um, yeah, it, it was really effective. And funding. So you said you self-funded, you haven't taken bank yeah no self-funded and you know sometimes I question that and I wonder if and it is a question I'm looking at at the moment but in terms of you know whether it would be accelerating things more for me to actually take loans out but um, I like I guess having a family and everyone has to sort of weigh up the, the risks for themselves I suppose and if you were to start up today with plenty of funding would you go into your industry absolutely and that's mainly because of your passion for it Uh, I think twofold. I think number one happens to be my passion and my area of expertise. They both align. And number two, I think there's, uh, there's three reasons. Number two is an increasing need because of the way our world is evolving with technology and the way that our attention is being fragmented. So more now more than ever, we need practices like mental fitness training that are going to help us really stay present and focused no matter what we're doing. And number three, I think the mental health crisis, you know, the World Health Organization says depression is um, the leading burden of disease and disability in the world. And it's kind of getting worse, especially now with this pandemic. And we know from the research that mindfulness is a really powerful vehicle and tool to help people maintain their mental health. Yeah, it's a huge area. And I think I read a study last year about the millennials coming out and particularly to the workforce, this is before COVID, but just the I think a lot of the specialists said that they hadn't seen such a health crisis with anxiety and depression coming in. And a lot of it was to do with the um, iPhone generation growing up. Not a lot of in-person, most communication, as you would know, 80% something like that is non-verbal. So 
you know, millennials tapping away on their phone, communicating mainly through SMS or Facebook Messenger, etc., have missed a lot of the social cues. So they go into a workplace and don't understand the the you know the vagaries of the mm. non-verbal communication. So apparently, mm, that's really interesting and really worrying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, I think, I think a lot of our time is spent with our focus externally and I think that it's just we, culturally we know that if we want to be physically fit and energetic and, and work at our best physically in our, in our lives, then we have to train mm. and the same is true for our minds. It's just the science is unequivocal now. If you want a mind that is functioning at its best, you actually need to train it. You can't just sort of default and let it run its own software and program. Yeah, Good point. And back on the distractions now in society, have you read um, Cal Newport's book, Deep Work? I haven't. I've, I've, it's, it's definitely on the list. It's hmm. been on the list. I've been trying too busy trying to do deep work. <laughs> but it's <laughs> oh, on my list. The it's, irony. <laughs> yes, it's, it's definitely up there. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Yeah, I would say the same point as when I realized that, you know, things were going well. So that that year that I left my job and put everything into the business, it grew um, sort of tripled in size and it 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 really quite frankly steamrolled me and mm-hmm. and I got quite burnt out. It was sort of ironic that I was running a meditation <laughs> burnt out. It wasn't the irony wasn't lost on me and I actually felt quite ashamed to be honest, but I um you know, I flipped it and I realized you have a bit of self-compassion there, which is also part of what we teach in mindfulness, just going easy on yourself because I really, I'd never run a business. I had no idea what I was doing at that point. And, you know, it was a wonderful thing that it had done so well, but I just felt, I, I think the lesson was that I just, I, I was too tight on spending money. I was too scared to spend money to get extra supports like VAs and all the things that I could have delegated out. And I was just, I was, I'm very good at working hard. That's what I learned in medicine as well. So I I was just working too hard and and sort of not wanting, you know, too afraid to spend the money that I needed to spend to kind of make sure that that wouldn't have happened to me. Yep. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I am more of a kind of ideas generating person and creative. So the side of business that I've had to learn the most is around, you know, uh, spreadsheets, P&Ls, cash flow, all of that sort of thing. Yep. And, 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 you- that, and, and, and actually on that point, you know, coming from, again, from a health, from a career in, in health where you don't learn any of this stuff and you're completely clueless about it. Um, it was, I think one of the lessons as well was for anyone starting off in business, get a financial person on side immediately. So I, I just didn't even know that until I got a coach myself. And then they said, oh, you really need to get someone to help you with your, you know, with the, with the nuts and bolts of your financial situation here. So. I oh, totally agree. Yeah. And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? I think that, you know, it's that classic thing about running your own business, the boundaries of work and the fact that, there's always something to do and to manage and that there's never really stability. So I I always laugh when I hear about these ads of, you know, passive income and this and that, because I just think when you're running a business and it's growing fast and it's continuing to grow, there's just always change. So the least, I think the thing that is both the positive and the negative on the one side, I love it because it's never boring. There's always something new, but on the other side, it feels like, and that's why mindfulness is so important to me. There's not many pauses and there's not many moments where things are just kind of cruising along. There's always something to do. And so I've learned that I really need to try and create those boundaries. And if I'm not, if I'm not doing some kind of mindfulness practice, then often I don't even realize how busy I am. And, and so you, you lose awareness of the fact that you do need to put in some full stops there. Yep. And that's the next question. What do you love most about growing a small business? I think for me, it's the impact. So it's what I'm doing. And each year we, you know, we run this global campaign. There's people from over 50 countries around the world, thousands of people. And I just, 
we get the most incredible feedback of literally how people's lives have been changed. You know, people that have suffered anxiety or people that are, you know, had some terrible thing happen that they've not been able to leave the house, they've been too upset and depressed and just incredible stories. So that's the most exciting thing for me. And that was really, you know, I went into psychiatry because I wanted to be of service and I really wanted to work with people and help them learn tools for flourishing. But to be able to do that on a really large scale rather than be one-to-one in a room with someone feels like the most exciting part of what I do. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? The biggest mindset, um, the biggest mindset switch has definitely been around how I spend and just a more being more comfortable about knowing that you need to spend money in order to grow a business and being more comfortable with kind of sitting with that risk. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Well, I probably bias, but I would say some form of mindfulness or some form of presence practice where mm. you're checking in with yourself and you're turning inwards, not just focusing outwards. Yep. That, that's a great advice. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our Kick-Ass Manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Yeah, I think that's a great topic. I could really have a conversation with you for hours on that one about <laughs> hiring and yep. what the, the things I've learned. I think one of the biggest things I've learned, well, two things are around hiring. Number one, number one is you don't necessarily want to hire the same person as you. You're looking for the complementarity. But on the other hand, there is that kind of uh, that sort of gut instinct of a, a sense of familiarity and a cultural fit that is important. So yep. I kind of went too far the other side once because I thought, oh, no, that hire didn't work because I, I, I found someone that was too much like me and that just didn't work. So then I kind of went the opposite and then I got someone that was a real mismatch for the cultural fit. Mm. And so just coming back to that middle path where you, you're clear on the skill sets and but it also does have to be a cultural fit to your brand and your business. What are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable kick-ass culture to help with the growth? I think it's really about recognising that you're dealing with people that just like you want to feel fulfilled, want to have a sense of meaning, want to feel respected. And so I've actually looked and kind of studied the way companies like Lululemon do what they do and gotten ideas around really helping the people that I'm working with actually evolve themselves as well. So it's not just about the business, but it's about caring about the individual and like what what do you want to achieve in your life and where do you see yourself five ten years from now even if that isn't a part of my business you know just being invested in the development of of the people that you're working with and you know i really try and walk my talk and sometimes you know that when we're really under pressure it it falls to the wayside a bit but you know before we do our meetings on zoom we we, we sort of put aside a few minutes to do a meditation in silence together and we check in and there's just different practices that i bring into the to the team culture and tell our audience how you've handled balance <laughs> the, the, the golden question yep, yep. I don't know if anyone on the planet can really answer that at this stage but yeah. uh, I would say it's like a seesaw I don't think there's a moment where it's like oh I've got a sustained sense of balance here I think it's just this seesawing and this constant as I've already said checking in so you know there are times where I am too busy and then I kind of feel the overwhelm and I have the mindfulness awareness and it's a sense of, oh, hang on a sec, things are a bit too hectic. I've got to pull back. So it's just a constant adjusting rather than this magical, for me anyway, rather than this magical feeling of, oh, I'm living such a balanced, even life. You know, it's, it's, it's a constant checking in and adjustment. Totally agree. And how much professional development did you invest in yourself? Like obviously, because you studied as a doctor, Yeah, that, that's quite. But I have, yeah, I've, I've done quite a lot of, uh, investment in in business and marketing and because that was all new to me and I found it really really helpful you know I remember the first program I purchased that was about two thousand dollars online and I 
I'd never spent that much online for a product before. And I was so nervous. This was many, many years ago. And it turned out to be a complete game changer. I mean, that taught me everything I know about marketing. And then that led to a few other different programs. And, uh, and I now have a coach that I work with who um, in person, who's really just helped me so much from a, from a nitty gritty business perspective, just all the different things I didn't know because I was working in a totally different space. I hadn't come from business or corporate. Yeah. Well, that's the next question. If you've had mentors or coaches along the way, can you tell us about that experience and values about it? Any other? Mentors? Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah, I would say it's funny. It's, I think it's, I think it's really hard to find a really great coach because there's, it's like a needle in a haystack. There's so many people out there talking about being business coaches and life coaches. And, and so it's funny because my coach came to me via word of mouth. He wasn't even putting himself out there as a business coach, but he'd worked in, you know, not-for-profit and McKinsey and, we were just having one session and then cut to five years later, we're still working together. And I always have a joke with him saying, you know, would you have signed up to this if you knew you were going to be stuck with me for five years? But, um, <laughs> but he's been really, really helpful, really helpful. I think it's really important, particularly, you know, if you, I work a lot on my own, we have a virtual team. And mm. so I just think it's really important to have someone to bounce ideas off and, and just check in. And often I find, even when I feel like everything's fine, I have a session with him and I can just, yeah, I just start to identify problems or challenges that might be emerging before they become too big. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? Uh, I don't formally, but I do have a lot of, I've got a handful of friends that are doing wonderful things in all kinds of different startups and businesses that I turn to informally for that. Great. Dr. Elise, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? I think the hardest thing is actually knowing what you don't know, finding, mm. you know, you, you, there's so much you don't know, but how do you know what you don't know? That's quite hard. And that's, again, why I would suggest having someone that's a little bit further down the line as a coach can be really invaluable. Favourite business book, which has helped you the most? So I've read a lot of business books. I have hundreds of them and so many of them have been useful. But one that comes to mind now is called The Messy Middle by Scott Belsky over in New York. Mm -hmm. up for hands. And I read it a number of years ago and I just found it to be really helpful because it literally is about that messy middle and knowing when to keep going and when to pull out and just this that confusion that can happen when you're at a certain point in your, in your business. Great. I'm going to add that one to my list for right now. Mm. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Yeah, I've got a number of different. I, I mean, I love Tim Ferriss. I've been following him since he started his podcast even earlier than that. And I love Amy Porterfield and Jonathan Fields. They're kind of a few of my go-to podcasts. Yeah. And one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? A tool that I would recommend to grow a small business. Mm -hmm. I really think a trained, refined, clear mind is really helpful. Uh, and then a, yeah, I, I think, I think having a coach is really great, particularly once you're sort of down the line a little bit into kind of the first or second year and you've actually realized you've created something that's going to continue to grow. Final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? You won't believe how long you're going to be doing this and it is going to be such a wild ride. You have no idea what you're signing up for. If you thought, oh, and another thing I'd add is if you thought being a doctor was hard, you just wait till you see what's going to <laughs> unfold over the next six years. As a business owner. Yeah. 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 Because well, I literally, I, I have a joke with my friends. I say, you know, I've worked in the most acute, you know, I've worked in emergency departments with people having cardiac arrests. I've worked in acute psychiatry wards with multiple suicidal people, you know, really unwell. And I still feel some days business is just trumps it all. <laughs> well, that makes me feel a little bit better now with 21 years in owning my own businesses. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for your time today, Dr. Elise. I think the audience will get a shit ton of value out of what you shared with us and congratulations on the journey and um, looking forward to... My, my pleasure. And yeah, I just I challenge people and I also want to just leave a final message for people. If you have never meditated and you think that you're terrible at it because you can't stop your mind from thinking, that's probably one of the biggest myths that goes around with meditation. Yep. And also another myth is that you have to do it for a long time. So I challenge people to come and join Mindful in May or the other programs to... Yep show themselves that they actually can meditate and it can literally change your life as it has mine. And even just 10 minutes a day. 
Absolutely. And, you know, start, start small and build up. Absolutely. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.